بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم uh, Good afternoon ladies and gentlemen On behalf of APM Terminals I would like to welcome you all and thank you for joining our live webinar Maintaining Resilient Supply Chains Through Crisis which is held under the patronage of His Excellency, Engineer Kamal bin Ahmed bin Mohammed, Minister of Transportation and Telecommunications, Bahrain. We would like to start uh, this very interesting webinar with a welcome remarks and opening speech by His Excellency, the Minister, Engineer Kamal. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, so delighted and pleased uh, to be with you today, attending this important conference call. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we are not meeting uh, uh, physically. We cannot see each other, but uh, I'm sure all of you get used now to conduct all your meeting by using conference call meeting. Uh, allow me first to take this opportunity to thank APM Terminal for organizing this important event. And also thank you all, uh, stakeholder, uh, individual, uh, representing different company who participate in this event uh, and for, for allocating the time uh, to discuss uh, what we have done in Bahrain to ensure a resilient uh, supply chain to our economy. Uh, I don't have to emphasize the importance of uh, maintaining uh, an efficient uh, supply chain uh, for our country, for our economy, to enable trade, to ensure the movement of goods, especially these days, the movement of the medical equipment, material, food, to make sure that uh, our people, the people who are living in Bahrain, feel comfortable that nothing will be changed uh, because uh, of COVID-19 uh, in our industries. I think uh, I can say that the shipping and the maritime industry has proved that together uh, we succeed to maintain uh, this the business continuity, to maintain uh, the resilient supply chain while preserving also the health and safety of all. Uh, and I, I would like to thank here uh, all uh, entities in public sectors as well as uh, private sectors. We all work together as one team, Bahrain team, I can call it, uh, to make it happen. Uh, it was always an efficient supply chain in Bahrain, but even during this challenges days, and uh, I hope it will not uh, prolongate to months, but I think we have proved that we can do it together. Uh, I'd like to thank the APM terminal, uh, the customers, uh, shipping lines, uh, all the stakeholders who are involved with us to, to make it happen. Uh, today we can see even growth uh, in Khalifa bin Salman, which is an important facility for us in Bahrain, important infrastructures, because 80% of the trade volume of the, in the kingdom is entering through uh, Khalifa bin Salman port. Uh, today uh, we see 7% increase in TAUs volume, uh, 40, uh, 49 increase in general cargo, uh, uh, and uh, 28 increase uh, in visual calling Khalifa bin Salman uh, in comparison to the last year. So everything is in order, everything is moving, uh, our people uh, are doing what they're supposed to do. And as I said, uh, I need to thank ABM Terminal for so many things they have done to ensure that all our staff who are working in our ports are uh, following uh, uh, the health and safety standards, making sure that they have all the necessary uh, equipment to facilitate their jobs, working together with customs, working together with immigration, with all entities and the port, uh, the ministry uh, uh, represented in the maritime and port uh, efforts. I think, as I said, we proved together that we can do it and we have done it. I hope we will continue working together closely. Today, I'm sure you will discuss uh, and, uh, other, sub uh, other issues. You will identify the issues that need to be addressed that we can also take care of it uh, going forward. So I've been asked only to give uh, a few words as a opening remark to stimulate the discussion. We have good speaker today and I wish you uh, the best and uh, I hope uh, that you will all overcome and come out of these uh, times stronger. So stay, uh, stay safe and uh, I wish you the best of this uh, conference call. Thanks a lot, Your Excellency. Okay, we, thank you. we would also like to thank our government and Team Bahrain for all the great things they are doing in this very interesting and challenging time. Now we will be having our panel. 
moderated by Dr. Christopher Hockel, Senior Manager, Value Chain Transformation, uh, Transformati Transformation uh, KPMG, uh, Ms. Susan Hunter, Chief Executive Officer, APM Terminals, Mr. Ahmed Al Naama, Chairman of Transportation Logistics Committee with BCCI, Ms. Iman Ibrahim, General Manager, Supply Chain, Pulad Holding, Mr. Balaji Ardenari, the Chairman of Bahrain Shipping and Agents Association, Mr. Omar Nasif, Plant Director, Mondelez Bahrain Biscuits, and Mr. Ali Mdefa, Director, Head of Manufacturing, Trans Transport and Logistics Business Development at EDB. Uh, once the panel is started, the Q&A will be handed later. So please, Dr. Christoph, I will leave it to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, for, for handing over. Uh, and uh, welcome to everybody from, from, from my side. <clears throat> um, we already heard from His Excellency the Minister that things went quite well. And in our session, we want to understand in the panel discussion, how, how did that happen? And then get the feedback from the panel speakers to understand a little bit better. How do we maintain a resilient supply chain through the crisis? And looking at different um, or different lenses or different perspective from an industry industrial uh, perspective. Omar, uh, what were the biggest challenge you have faced during uh, within your supply chain during the crisis in the past weeks and and how did, how did you react to those challenges um, to overcome them? Okay, so allow me first of all to thank you very much uh, APM Terminus for allowing us to uh, to have this uh, meeting. Uh, as well as thank Team Bahrain for the close and continuous support that we have been getting throughout this situation. And I, I uh, though we will be talking about some challenges today, but I think we were really lucky um, uh, in, in Bahrain uh, having this close support and how the, the situation was handled uh, in general. So um, the main key challenges that we had um, during that timing was related to um, our definitely we are a manufacturing facility producing uh, foods uh, snacking basically and um, we had issues related to the uh, raw and pack material availability uh, as well as some challenges related to um, uh, exporting our finished goods especially that we are exporting to 28 countries among which are GCC and Australia and South Africa and some more Southeast Asian companies, uh, sorry, countries. So it was, uh, there were some limitations, uh, although the, we did not face uh, the causeway blockage because uh, we were uh, we were exempted as a food company. However, uh, for some countries uh, that had um, limitation for visas uh, for only its uh, residents, uh, so usually it um, uh, all drivers for trucks, for road shipments, uh, whether for raw and packed materials coming into the plant or finished goods coming out of the plant, visas were uh, were given on the on arrival on the border. But as part of the uh, this situation, this was not available. So this has uh, caused some um, shortages in in, uh, in raw and packed material and some also hinges in the uh, finished goods. Uh, our capability to issue, to export our finished goods. So. Uh, these, this was also, the, there were also challenges in some of the materials we get through uh, sea shipments due to the delays that are happening in uh, the ports due to lockdown in different uh, countries that we uh, source our materials from. Um, but uh, at the end of the day, we were able to continue our supply safely. I would just mention quickly what are the key things that we have done to, uh, to mitigate these actions. Uh, basically, most of the actions taken were really proactive, where we started uh, in, in February uh, preparing a, a business continuity plan where we have done a risk assessment of the key risks. And those risks were definitely one of the risks that were there. So one key mitigation was increasing our safety stocks for our critical materials. Um, so in some cases for local materials uh, that we get from GCC, we increased from two weeks to four weeks, or for example, uh, even exceeding that to eight weeks in materials that we import from, uh, from outside. So that was actually one of the key actions that we have taken. Uh, this action was not only for our raw and packed materials, but was also for our finished goods. Um, 
So we also increased our safety uh, safety stocks of finished goods, especially for the critical products that we produce uh, in our distributors. Um, and that has really helped us uh, to be flexible in uh, in uh, responding to any delays that are uh, happening. That was one key thing. Another key thing was also, uh, of course, when road shipments had some issues related to visas with, uh, we were also looking for different uh, other transporters uh, that would have um, drivers who has the, uh, uh, the right visas. The, uh, that are requested by the countries uh, at that time. So because this was not uh, available for uh, for lots of suppliers, so we had to look for transporters who can take um, who can take our our raw materials to us. Um, uh, this was one action as well. And the other action was uh, shifting some of our road shipments into uh, into sea shipments and in some materials, uh, light materials like flavors. Uh, we had to go for uh, for air freight. Um, that was mainly uh, the key actions that we have taken. In addition to that, we were also uh, uh, shifted to uh, some uh, backup local suppliers that we had um, uh, for some of our critical materials in, in Bahrain. Uh, but there were some delays uh, because they were actually constrained as well to other customers. But uh, really, I would like to thank uh, the EDB uh, and the full team Bahrain. There was a lot of close support in order to overcome uh, this situation and to get out of it in a, in a smooth way. Those, these were some of the uh, reactive measures that we have taken in order to, to ensure our supply chain continuity. And it, it went well, alhamdulillah. Okay, good. So, so understood, Omar. It's, it's, it was a package of, of proactive. You already started early in the process. You had some re reactive, and what I also understood, it was a good combined team effort in Bahrain that helped you to overcome those challenges. Yeah, exactly. Maybe uh, Iman, from from your side, you also have the the, the industry uh, lens. Uh, was it similar um, at your plant, the challenges, and, and, and how you solved the challenges um, in this crisis? Yes, Victor. So first of all, uh, I would like to thank the uh, for hosting us during this panel. And I'm just uh, going to echo what uh, Omar has mentioned. From an industry perspective, I believe all of us, we're facing the same issue. Because uh, if I will summarize, COVID-19 is like the black swan which means that even was unpredictable even to us and has a big impact and predictable impact actually to all of us. So the uh, business continuity uh, during the global disturbance is the biggest challenge for any industry. So if I uh, summarize the uh, main challenges, I can summarize them into three important bullet points. And the first one is the country lockdown. So as Samar mentioned, the availability of the material due to the lockdown which uh, we were facing for uh, the country and that lockdown was started from February in China and uh, it's extended to uh, India, South Africa, to the to the uh, West which is Europe and US has a big impact on us. Yes, we were having our predictable uh, measurement and the contingency plan but still uh, that was we were having like a limited safety stock which we are having a pressure to maintain the safety stock. Uh, on another impact, it was having an impact as well in terms of uh, doing the due diligence for the backup vendor. Uh, during such a crisis, you need to have your backup vendor. But do you have the right time to do the uh, due diligence? Definitely, it was very tough for us. And we need just to have a quick decision to go for alternative backup as soon as possible. Another impact uh, in terms of the uh, challenges is even losing the traceability of the material. Some of the supplier, they ship the material, but they were itself, they were losing the traceability. Where is this material? Is it stuck on the border? Is it uh, stuck on the port? So we're having such challenges. So mm -hmm. this country lockdown definitely was having an impact on us. The second challenge is uh, the impact on the costing of the material. Uh, some of the supplier actually, when they were sharing with us a force major letter, Either you increase your price, either we need to lock down our uh, factory and we cannot live. So we're having pressure to adjust our budget and go on. Uh, last but not least, uh, the causeway. 
Although the causeway was, uh, thanks God, it was not uh, closed uh, between Bahrain and Saudi. However, there was a delay from the causeway and it was having definitely uh, a little impact on us. And uh, similar to the uh, transportation between also other GCC country through Saudi, they, they stopped the transportation through road. So we mm. were having like uh, another option to go for sea freight and definitely that was having an impact on us. So if I will ego what Omar has mentioned, uh, yes, we were having some challenges, but we were having some measurements in terms of contingency plan in a way that we need to survive. Still, I do remember once we were having this issue, I was coming to my team and I was telling them, and the guys, you need to uh, plan for protecting yourself from a bomb that that might be explode anytime. So you would need to survive. Even if you will bleed, you need to protect yourself and survive. And actually, based on this KBI, which we bring it to our team, we put our protective measurement. And first of all, as Omar he mentioned, we build our safety stock. So some of the material we put our safety stock, we build ourselves even maybe up to end of Q2. And some of the material, if the space is allowing us, we are putting our safety stock, which is going to be covering us also up to Q3. That's only depending on the shelf life of the material. So one uh, of the protective measurements is to build your safety start. The other measurement which we uh, put it as well as the easy on the payment term. Some of the suppliers, they need your help during this time to let them survive. So by the end, you will survive. So easy your payment term with them in a way that you will survive with them. Uh, uh, last but not least is regarding building your network. I believe we over uh, challenge this uh, crisis by building our network. Thanks God so far we were not having any need to borrow of some material from other supplier, but we were having some calls from our steel manufacturer, our uh, other uh, colleagues who were trying to contact us to uh, borrow some of the material from us. So I believe to overcome such challenges, you need to make sure that you are building your network with your suppliers, or with your uh, other colleagues, just to make sure that maybe by the end you will need them. So uh, that's very quick summary from my side, Doctor. Thank you. Maybe from a more broad, I would say, overall supply chain sector view, um, Ahmed, what, what was your experience in the challenges uh, from, from a Bahrain point of view and then how those challenges may overcome? My, my challenges are great, uh, Chris. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you uh, for having us or giving us this opportunity to talk a little bit of what we are doing at the Bahrain Chamber of Commerce and a little bit broader outside this. At BCCI, through 10 different committees, we've been very proactive, working with different uh, government authorities to making sure the supply of food, uh, medical equipment, uh, uh, at the right time and at the right price. Uh, the other thing, I would like also to take this opportunity to thank the Saudi authorities at the causeway uh, for cooperating with us uh, to the extent possible to making sure you know, there's a swift uh, operation of uh, trucks, cars, etc., for moving uh, goods and other things uh, on the causeway. Uh, when it comes to aviation, of course, uh, as you know, uh, we had uh, the past uh, few occasions where aviation industry was hit very bad. One was September 11. Uh, and the other one, of course, was uh, the uh, volcanic ash at Iceland in 2010. And of course, uh, this hit is the worst in the history of aviation. And uh, as you know, uh, contribution of aviation to the economy is, is great. If aviation was a country, it would have been number 20 and G countries GDP top 20 in the world, uh, we were close to say Switzerland. We employ over 65 uh, million jobs. So uh, from my perspective, from my point of view, I think we have to work uh, يعني, with World, uh, world Health Organization, airlines and developed countries to find more swift and fastest way 
to uh, to uh, test the coronavirus because the way things are going, this will lead to the collapse of many airlines around the world. Yesterday, day before yesterday, we heard Virgin Australia is shut down. Uh, also today, this morning, I was reading the South African airline is uh, talking of shutting down also completely and more and more uh, to come. If there are no quick actions taken, an example of uh, uh, September 11, you can see up to now the measures or security measures that were taken at the airports to building confidence uh, for passengers to fly. The, the air transport or the air travel was completely stopped post, uh, post September 11. Authorities, airports, government introduced these security measures to letting the passenger feel confident about or with regard to flying, etc. Although now the whole world is looking for vaccines and medicines to treat uh, coronavirus. However, I would like through this webinar to, uh, to suggest that we find a quicker way of uh, testing uh, the uh, coronavirus or COVID-19 at the airport. So all passengers that are on board the airplane are clean, like security measures that you take. Airlines are confident, passengers are confident, so receiving airports are confident that the passenger on board the airplane and security wise they are clean. We have to have the same measures now to combating uh, coronavirus. We have to have a faster ways of testing the passenger for coronavirus before boarding the airplane. If we leave now things, you know, the vaccine will take at least a year. Medical, uh, the medicine maybe will take a week, two weeks, whatever. That will not bring the industry in, into its shape again. So uh, we have to find a quick ways to build, I mean, to find ways to test uh, passengers immediately before boarding the aircraft. So whoever is on board the airplane is clean, no coronavirus effects. So the receiving country, they don't have to keep them again or to keep them in uh, quarantine, etc. So this is one option. Uh, the other thing, uh, as we said, uh, the airlines cannot sustain or cannot only be patient more than this. Most of the airlines will be grounded and unfortunately the, the world economy will be hit bad. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Ahmed. Um, looking looking from, a, from a also overall, Ali, what was your perspective on the biggest uh, challenges of the supply chain from your point of view? And what, 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 how, how, how did they get solved from your point of view? Uh, thank you, Chris, and thanks to all my colleagues on this call, and thanks for providing us the opportunity to speak at this great forum. Um, I think at the outset, just to take an even broader perspective and a broader view, a uh, pandemic of this magnitude, according to the scientific community, is reportedly a one in a 100 year event. Um, and what makes this very interesting is that it's all unfolding in an increasingly interconnected and globalized environment. Uh, needless to say, air, sea and road transport uh, networks globally between countries are being disrupted. Um, I think in the face of global disruption and a lot of the bad news that we've been hearing uh, lately over the past couple of months is that the existing supply chain models of companies are increasingly being challenged and all companies are being forced to leave their comfort zones and look at alternative ways to do business to adapt to the current situation, uh, be it full-fledged contingency arrangements, increased labor and workforce planning, uh, extending their supply chain networks, and a complete re-evaluation of uh, inbound and outbound logistics networks. Um, generally speaking, in terms of what the government of Bahrain has done thus far, uh, at the very outset of the crisis, we have uh, the government, and I can speak on their behalf uh, here, taken swift and decisive action to mitigate the risks, uh, to soften the blow, and to lessen the burden on citizens and companies, inst individuals and institutions via an unprecedented $11.4 billion economic stimulus package, uh, which is very comprehensive and continues to, to evolve as time goes on, uh, which is 
primary and the initiatives therein are comprised of the payment of all insured Bahraini private sector employee salaries for a period of three months, the automatic payment of individuals and companies electricity and water utility bills for a period of three months, exempting individuals and companies from municipal fees, tourism related fees uh, for, uh, for tourism companies, uh, terminating uh, uh, labor market regulatory authority uh, fees, as well as doubling the liquidity support fund to 530 million US dollars. Additionally, on the financial side, the Central Bank of Bahrain has uh, embarked on a very comprehensive program whereby loan facilities amounting to $9.8 billion uh, have been allocated to allow debt installments to be deferred and for extra credit to be extended. Um, and finally, the labor fund Temkin has taken bold steps as well to completely redirect almost completely redirect their support programs towards the disadvantaged and adversely affected companies. Uh, I think all of these initiatives uh, by the government uh, in, in tandem with uh, concerted Team Bahrain effort uh, have been passed to kind of uh, mitigate the risks. Uh, I think supply chain is a very complicated matter. Uh, from my discussion of companies, uh, the sentiment going around is that a lot of companies are uh, kind of reshuffling their entire supply chain networks, with, whereby, for example, courier and express companies rely, uh, were small pack or small shipments. Uh, the tendency now in Bahrain is to shift to from air freight to sea freight. Uh, and that's something that's very, very atypical. And a lot of companies are finding uh, ways to adapt to the current situation. Uh, but I think uh, a lot of the what is being extended and done by Team Bahrain is uh, would really go a long way towards uh, making the post-COVID-19 world uh, much more tech-oriented, a much more automated, and a much more efficient environment for companies. And I think, uh, needless to say, supply chain and logistics companies, manufacturing companies will all will all have to change and adapt their systems. Okay, Th thanks, Ali. Um, just we heard just from Ali that uh, there have been some changes from from air logistics to to. Um, also to sea logistics and, and, and street logistics. Uh, Balaji, um, looking, you're looking more from a, from a shipping view lens. Um, could, uh, what kind of challenges did you face and, 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 and what, 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 how did you solve those challenges? And, and is that already visible for you that there are changes in, in logistics happening? Uh, thank you, Chris. Thank you very much. From the very beginning, we were quite clear that we didn't want to create any chaos or confusion in the market due to disruption in supply chain. This was uh, very well understood by everybody. So we had to ensure that the ships will come on time, which we established. Having said that, our key concern was our bill of lading counters and delivery order counters can get crowded very quickly. I mean, as uh, my colleagues here as were saying, we were new to the situation. Things were evolving. So we had to put necessary measures in place to maintain social distancing without causing any disruption to our services offered to customers so that they can go clear the cargo and keep the supply chain running. Once that is established, we are not used to working from home. We, we always have to be in office, field the document, verify so many things. That's the way we have been doing business for so many years. Suddenly we have to change the system and almost today as I speak, about 90% of the staff are working from home. So we have to make the necessary changes, infrastructural changes, security changes, IT changes. All these things had to be done quickly when the situation as it was evolving. And then as, uh, as Omar was saying, as the cost was getting congestion, we have to handle the additional volumes, which, is, uh, which was uh, available from Bahrain. Many shippers opted to go the sea route instead of waiting in the causeway because these shipments were urgent in nature. It has to reach either Oman or, or uh, Dubai, so it has to be handled that way. But having said that, quarter one, although we saw a drop in volumes uh, from China and Asia in the first uh, one and a half month, uh, the cargo volumes from uh, Europe and North America did not dip. So quarter one, the volumes were stable in Bahrain port. But what we are going to see with things happening around the world now, we expect and we estimate uh, there will be a 15-20% drop in the volume from Indian subcontinent, Europe and North America in the days to come, which we will feel to uh, feel to uh, the drop to come in the effect from 
middle of May till probably June, July as well. And this could have an impact on export volume, but there could be a shortage of boxes, and that will be a challenge for the carriers to be to be addressing in the, in the days to come. Uh, having said that, uh, the port has opened up a new corridor uh, which will handle foodstuff and medical supplies on a priority basis with pre-arrangement with all the shipping line to ensure that there is no shortage of any essential commodities in the market. These are the arrangements what we've done in the shortest possible time. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Balaji. And so, Susan, you, you're kind of um, all in the middle of that, I would say, with, with, with your port. Um, how you relate to those challenges and also to, 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 the, um, to the activities you had or reactions you had to your challenges in the port? Yes, yeah, so, so Chris, I think for us there's just two things. So uh, you can hear from the, the other speakers how important it is that the port stays open and continues to run uh, as effectively as normal. And that meant for us straight away assuring the, the safety of our people. And I think uh, thanks to the minister for mentioning, but we took that so seriously. We are a critical piece of infrastructure and uh, we needed to take whatever precautions were necessary to make sure that our people were safe and also all of our other port users, customers, subcontractors, anyone who was using the port was able to do so safely and also without risking that it would cause further infection or cause us to close. There's also a lot of focus for us on business continuity. So, you know, it's inevitable that we would have some cases. We have a, over 600 people in the port and many more users. So we had to have strong business continuity that said, even if we lose a shift, how will we still operate? And, and we took that right down to us being left with only one shift and even beyond that. And then, you know, even just simple things like, do we have the parts for our own equipment? Has our supply chain worked? And I think the second part for us is, is very straightforward. You, you've just heard all of the challenges that our customers had to face. And I saw our role very positively as anticipating those challenges or being agile enough to respond to those challenges and where we can make adjustments that absorb some of that pain or adjustments that allow us to support our customers and even new customers, as you heard from people moving from uh, air aviation over to, to sea, to be able to meet those customers' needs at short notice. And uh, I think, thank you, Bala, for mentioning uh, the critical cargo project was one example. We could see that for COVID supplies and or essential supplies for the island, we had to make sure that we worked with the shipping lines to be able to store them in a way that would allow us to move very fast and, and, and uh, dispatch that cargo uh, into the island. And that required us to work with our partners in customs and the port authorities and, and our customers to make sure that happens. So that really was the challenge for us was to anticipate those requirements and be agile enough uh, to work with our partners and listen well enough to be able to respond. So that, that's how we see our role and, and that's what we continue to do. Good. Maybe maybe just one question came up, Susan. Um, somebody asked if, if you had to bring additional staff or technology on, in place to, 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 to mitigate those challenges or how did, how did you manage that? Yeah, certainly. So that, that touches on the business continuity that I, I talked about. So on a daily basis, we have more, more than sufficient people to be able to, to meet the demand. Now, any port, as you all know, actually has flexes in their demand week on week. So we actually also work with subcontracted uh, employees as well to make sure we almost have the capacity to flex up and down with the requirements of or, and the demands of the port. And then on top of that, like I said, we had to face the real reality that we could either by quarantine or simply by some of our employees becoming unwell, actually lose some of our people. And so we, we really went down to a name by name basis of all extremes uh, of splitting our accommodation to make sure that no one, if, you know, if something happened in the accommodation, we wouldn't lose all of our people. So we rented uh, already more than a month ago additional accommodation uh, to making sure that our shifts did never interact with each other and never actually uh, came into contact. So if one shift was lost, God forbid, we would still be able to run the port right through to extreme ideas like uh, having to bring a whole shift to be accommodated inside the port in temporary accommodation. And we also work with the government to even look at are there any other options of people who could be trained potentially to, to operate our equipment. So, so we look at, you know, it's not so much just about, you know, bringing in additional staff. We already had that capacity to flex. It was just about making sure our planning was sufficient and practiced enough that we could handle any situation. And I'm pleased to say so far we have been able to do that. 
good, sounds good. Um, maybe leaving the challenges a little bit and then and, and the, the, the short term reactions. Uh, Susan, what what is the, I mean, we already touched a little bit with you on that. What are the main lessons learned from this crisis concerning your supply chain reality? Also, maybe looking forward then uh, for, for you. So, so come, coming out of the, or still to some extent in the middle of the crisis, but already, I mean, it's been going on for a while. So what are the main lessons learned so far for you and for the board? Sure. So I won't touch too much more on that. Uh, I think I've talked a lot about learning about planning. The planning doesn't always mean that we execute exactly as it was planned, but it means we're sharp and we've thought of a lot of situations should a new situation come up. So I think that's one lesson that I just need to touch upon and reinforce. It's taking a lot of planning for many different scenarios inside the terminal to be ready for it, for the ones that could happen and ones that we haven't even thought of. I think the bigger learning, and this comes from us, but also uh, reaching out to China and other ports across the world and using our larger network, is understanding how dependent the supply chains are on each other. So we're only one part. For example, I can do everything I can do to keep our port open, but if our partners in customs or uh, in the clearance agents or the, the shipping line agencies, if we are not all working together and taking those precautions, uh, you know, we can't operate. And I think what's really encouraging is, is listening today and hearing, you know, that everyone has been in this from the beginning together, taking all the necessary actions. And that's the learning. We almost have to uh, to collaborate and do that together because we're only ever as strong as, as our weakest link. And there we have to be supporting each other. And I think that's the one thing that we need to take away from this, excuse me, take away from this crisis uh, and keep going uh, and, and working collaboratively together. And we're so fortunate in Bahrain that we already had those relationships and that people are already thinking that way and that the government were supporting us in such an amazing way. But I think it's a lesson we should learn and not take for granted uh, should we ever face challenges like this again. Thanks. Balaji, from, from the lessons learned, what, what, what was the lessons or lessons learned from, from your side from a shipping point of view? Balaji? I think you're still on mute. Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Well, we have learned nothing is impossible. Everything is doable if you have the right plan, like Susan was mentioning a while ago. Uh, digital platform going forward. I think that that's, that's, there's a lot of learning because we never, like I said, we never are used to working from home. Looks like there's no need to have bigger offices if you can plan well. And if you can have the right infrastructure and digital platform, there's much more, uh, we can achieve things much more better. Uh, a formal body uh, in future, going in the future, a formal body like supply chain crisis management team, if we can have all the key stakeholders together in Bahrain, this will be a guiding team or a guiding path for any future such eventuality which can be handled in a much, much better way instead of, we, we, must, we were initially we were scrambling because like, like my colleague was saying it, this was new to us. None of us expected this to happen. So if you have a team, crisis management team, that can give us a better understanding and this will be good for battle. Okay, thanks. And um, Ali, for, from, from your point of view, thinking about the lessons learned over the past few weeks and about the crisis, what were your personal lessons or your, your takeaways? I mean, from my interaction with companies, I think the sentiment going around is that, which underscores almost every talk that I've had with a logistics company or a manufacturing company is uh, companies would going forward would have to rethink how, the way they're structured in the sense that decentralization and uh, uh, for companies to rethink how they're based even geographically. Um, we might in the future see less mega projects, less consolidated logistics hubs or mega manufacturing hubs uh, we might see a lot of uh, fragmented, smaller uh, setups uh, globally and indeed in the region as well. Uh, so that's one key takeaway. And uh, I think a lesson learned as well is for, to diversify supply chain network, uh, lessening the reliance on a certain system or a route or, uh, or lessening the reliance on one source. So a, a manufacturer that has traditionally relied on China as a source of raw material will have to rethink now to have a plan B, plan C, plan D, I mean, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so those are the key lessons. Uh, and just from listening to Susan, Bala, and everyone else on the panel, uh, 
uh, I, I do take great pride in seeing a lot of uh, the companies adapting and working in a very pragmatic way to weather the storm. Uh, and also proud uh, of the support that uh, Team Bahrain is always extending to the private sector uh, uh, at all times. Um, another lesson I think is, uh, which is something that has always been the case and always been pushed for uh, globally, is tech adoption. Uh, that can't be stated enough. Technology, uh, technology and technology in everything. Um, so an industry 4.0. So okay. that is uh, that was the wave of the future. That's something that we've been focused on. But I think the, our hand is forced now to adopt new technologies. Thank you. Thank you, Ali. Ahmed, from, from your side, also some lessons learned. Well, I agree with my colleagues, uh, Belaji and Ali uh, However, as you know, the government of Bahrain was uh, only proactive uh, in dealing uh, with this pandemic uh, crisis, we were among the first countries taking measures uh, on how to control uh, the spread of uh, the coronavirus. And all the sectors you know, were innovative and in, in dealing with, with this uh, crisis. Uh, one small example, our national carrier uh, Gulf Air, as you know, their, their fleet are all passenger flights. However, they have commissioned uh, some of the airplanes only just to uh, take uh, cargo, especially perishables uh, from places like uh, Indian subcontinent, etc. So uh, these plans uh, were very good, I think. It, it has helped uh, the market uh, and the only supply and uh, maintaining uh, good prices, etc. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Uh, looking a little, little, looking again a little bit more through the industrial view, um, you mind from your point of view, what do you see a lesson learned, and maybe not only the lesson learned, how maybe would, sh how maybe will that shape your supply um, chain strategy differently from a long term point of view? I believe from uh, industry perspective, you always learn the uh, tax lessons because you need to make sure that you are having continuous supplies without impacting your cost. So uh, the lessons which I learned is never take things as a granted, especially whenever you are dealing with your vendors, because one day if this vendor you don't need him, it will turn around that you need the supplier. So make sure that you are keeping your relationship alive with each and every available uh, suppliers because the crisis never will be stopped. Um, another thing uh, I believe in uh, in a manner of uh, take this uh, crisis and an opportunity from my side. I took this an opportunity to localize as much as I can because during the normal situation, no one, especially from operation of the perspective, will give you a, a hand to localize your uh, your material. So mm -hmm. from my side, I took this an opportunity that I will look into localizing as much as I can just to make sure that we are having our continuous of supplies. Uh, last but not least, I believe uh, building, as I mentioned earlier, earlier, is building our network. So building our network is a major lesson which I learned because we need to exchange the uh, knowledge relationship. Uh, in terms of uh, the uh, coming supply chain strategy, I believe uh, I'm proud to mention that Fulad company anyway is uh, for uh, all, uh, industry, which means that we are looking into a digitalization. However, we need to enhance as much as we can our digitalization platform because with the digitalization you can stay alive. Uh, we need to work into more procurement intelligence and definitely working into more of uh, industrial platform, which we can exchange digitalization uh, and all the ideas together without impacting our business. Okay, thank you. Omar, from, from your point of view, also some lessons learned and, and how, how will that materialize in, in I would say, yeah, the enhancement of your supply chain strategy for the future, to, to, to get it more resilient from your point of view? Yeah, so um, one of the key uh, lessons learned that will really impact our strategy moving forward is the way how we evaluate suppliers and uh, we choose them. 
So, um, so actually, uh, before it was really uh, one of the key criteria of choosing suppliers is price. Among definite, uh, definitely other uh, other um, criteria like lead time, transportation, reliability, and other uh, and other criteria, but price was a determining one. I think moving forward, the strategy would lean more into um, other flexibility uh, uh, criteria like uh, lead time. Uh, moving maybe uh, our strategies into more into VMI models where uh, you rely on traders to store the stocks for you and secure the stocks that is needed more uh, proximity of uh, proximity of the geographical proximity to the manufacturing facility is also one of the key things that we need to uh, to come into the equation much more than before i i um it's they were all part of the equation uh, but they will definitely be uh, in a in a much more uh, importance uh, than it they used to be before that is one of the things um, and that also brings uh, to uh, what iman was talking about related to localization so yes localization was a point of focus uh, but will become an even uh, more important point a uh, second part uh, that I want to build on what Susan has been uh, mentioning also related to planning. Uh, so we used to have in, in our case in Mondelez, we had a business conting uh, contingency plan uh, that covered lots of the risks that actually happened on ground. But uh, we were always uh, ready in our business continuity plans with what if scenarios, even sometimes covering uh, situations of earthquakes, but actually uh, if we look into what our practices now, the, the proactive actions that we are taking now uh, to overcome these scenarios when they are happen, they were not as, um, as much as it, they should be. So what I mean to say is that the what if scenarios always had lots of reactive actions. When this happens, we will do one, two, three, four. But we need to embed more proactive actions that we do from now so that uh, if a situation happens, we are ready uh, from now, something like localization is one one definite example of that. Uh, the last but not least, actually the most important, uh, was actually a learning that we had related to the way we look into the safety of our employees um, and delivering that message. Because um, in 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 for all our companies, we always deliver the message that safety comes as number one and there is always very rigid solid and clear policies of how to maintain that safety and all where the all people are empowered to take decisions whenever they relate to safety however the situation here is a little bit tricky because it is not the usual thing where you can uh, eliminate the risk you will have to live with the risk and this is something that we need to deal with in a different way that, uh, than the way we used to do before. Um, and that brings a lot of engagement we need in order to mitigate the, the new risks. Uh, if you look into the COVID situation, there was always ambiguity about what to do, whether to wear masks, not to wear masks, and other, other things of what are the actions to be taken. There were lots of ambiguity among that. So definitely one of the key things is to engage the team and to make the... Um, uh, the ma measures uh, of keeping people safe, uh, engaging and um, and I mean active. So uh, they would not be like rigid policies. They will be updated every day and that brings in communication, the importance of readily communication to the teams and engaging them in place. So this is the, the key learnings and uh, how it will affect the strategies uh, from my point of view. Thank you, Omar. Susan, from, from, from your point of view, <clears throat> you already talked a little bit on the lessons learned from the port, but um, maybe if you will also want to comment on, on your maybe future changes of future supply chain strategy, what do you have in mind or is there anything that comes to your mind? Yeah, I mean, uh, certainly for us, Chris, I think, I think quite a few of my colleagues have mentioned it, you know, but we have learned an awful lot about e-learning and uh, not e-learning, <laughs> e-platforms and things that are, are really necessary. So, I mean, if you remember, we are ultimately a supplier. So, you know, we are based on being whatever it is or evolving the port into being whatever it is our customers need. So as we can see now, you know, 
there's going to be a buildup of resilience and redundancy into supply chains. That might mean, you know, storage might become an issue, the ability to speed up and slow down supply chains. All of this is going to change a little bit also how we do business. And then when you look at the, the e-platforms, the data, the tracking, all of this is going to be even more important for us as a port to be able to uh, anticipate and respond to, to those customer needs. So I think, you know, it's not so much that, you know, we'll still be lifting containers, we'll, we'll still be doing uh, the things that we do. It's just about being more agile and being able to, to flex to what our customers need uh, in terms of, you know, what, what they need to do with their supply chain uh, in terms of getting their cargo faster or slower or holding things or, so it's just more about that for us at the moment. And then, like I said, this will evolve. All right, we're about to see how supply chains are going to change and we just have to be ready to, to be agile. And I think that's just, again, I know I'm saying the same thing as before, but that's the truth. No one really knows exactly how this will play out. And as a major supplier, our job is to be ready to make those changes when they're needed. Thank you, Susan. Um, if, I, if I just, at this point, maybe have, have, have summarized a little bit about uh, maintaining the resilient uh, the resilience of, of supply chains through crisis. What I understood here so far is <clears throat> that um, from your point of view, I think it's it's important to have a good network or if, even if sometimes it's weak to, to, to build a little bit of stronger network. And I think Susan, you, you had a pretty, I think, strong point on that saying you're just part of one big network and you have to work with those people because it's, it's not only you failing, but maybe others failing that could, could leave um, to, to also to the board be failing. Then I understood also from Ali, uh, there will be technology, we need more enhancement in technology to, to, um, uh, to work on, 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 on those crisis situations. And I think technology always also comes with, um, um, with, with, with uh, what Iman has said, let, at, at the end of the day, be more in the position to analyze stuff, be more analytically, and, and, and maybe do also some some prescriptive or, or, or predictive, I would say, outlooks in the sense how things could evolve probably. I understood also from, from, from Omar and, and, and from Iman, so, so for most of you, be more proactive in the, in the sense of having contingency plans, so, so coming up with a good plan. Uh, because I think if you already have stuff uh, in, your, in, your, in your drawer and you just have to open up and then execute a plan, it's a lot different than if you also have to, um, 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 at the end of the day, have to first come up with a plan. This is going to take another time. I understood also to, to, to about localization, work as a team, and, and also, as I said, um, have a plan in place. These were the, 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 main, the main points I have gathered now um, f from your all conversation so far. Of about maintaining the resilience. Is there is there a major point I have dropped so far from your point of view? Okay, no, I think that's well covered, Chris. Okay, good, thanks. Maybe just before closing the session, a few minutes we had a, we had a few a few questions here coming up. There was um, I think one 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 questions one question that was to the overall panel. Um, I think it, it addresses also, besides besides uh, Corona and the crisis. I think we also can see there's some 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 um, it was phrased trade war going on throughout the world. If that's going to have some kind of impact additionally to the crisis, how you would comment on that? I think. Uh Christopher, if I may jump in here. Um, I mean, in terms of the trade war impact, uh, I mean, there is a political element here. Uh, I think anyone who's been following the news recently has seen that, you know, between the US and China and where this virus originated from and people are finding someone to blame. or So, uh, I mean, that will always be a lingering thing in the background. Um, so, um, uh, I, I think it's something we'll have to live with. It is what it is. Okay. As I, I think I think also Ali. I think we're uh, we're in the middle of the crisis. I think um, for, from 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 Corona. So this is overshining. I think take take bit by bit would be uh, uh, 
would be probably a good, as you said, it is what it is, and we just have to take it bit by bit. Yeah. Okay, I think we're up the hour. Um, Susan, as the host, um, do, do you want to have a few last words and, and kind of close the session? Yeah, yes, please, Chris, if, if that's possible. So uh, let me just start uh, somewhere by saying, you know, I think here in Bahrain, first of all, myself personally, and I think we're all truly grateful uh, for the world leading actions that have been taken uh, by His Royal Highness, the Crown Prince, and the National Task Force combating uh, COVID-19. It's their actions that are giving us the environment to be able to move forward and take and really stand up to this challenge. And we're inspired by these events. And actually, that was uh, that's what inspired me to have the ambition for this webinar was really to also unite the supply chain community across the kingdom to give us the chance to recognise, you know, all these amazing efforts that you've heard that have taken place and encourage us to, to continue to collaborate further uh, and excel in these challenges and opportunities that are absolutely as yet still still ahead of us. And when you listen to these discussions, you know, it's far exceeded what I could have hoped for. And, and I'm really filled with the belief that this community can continue to stand up to any challenges and really uh, support our economy and uh, the businesses and the customers uh, and the people across, across Bahrain. So if I can just uh, finish really then by just saying thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, to His Excellency Engineer Kamal bin Ahmed Mohammed, uh, the Minister of Transportation and Telecommunication, and uh, also his teams, uh, particularly the Ports and Maritime Affairs, uh, for their great support uh, for the crisis, but also for, for hosting this webinar. And then to you, Chris, uh, let's say thank you for, for your excellent facilitation. Um, and uh, to our panellists, thank you for sharing your thoughts and, and being so open and being the experts that you are in your field. It's really uh, brought an excellent dynamic uh, to this discussion and uh, wouldn't be fair if I didn't also thank Finmark and our own uh, communications teams here in APM terminals uh, who have worked hard, uh, especially on the technical side and, uh, and the advertisement and the marketing to make sure that this can can happen and we have a, a good discussion. But I think my, my final thanks uh, really goes to all of our partners uh, across the kingdom. Uh, especially those who have taken the time to join the call and also the American Chamber of Commerce who have supported us with this. But like I said at the beginning, this is a supply chain, which means there's so many parties involved uh, and doesn't work, like I said, unless we all work together. And I think this is a great start and we've seen some, some great collaborations. So, so I just want to finish this webinar by saying thank you for your time. Thank you for joining. Thank you for speaking and, uh, and thank you for your continued support. And uh, please stay safe. And I look forward to continuing to work together. Thank you, Susan. I think that ends us here then.